Today there exists a wound in the Middle East that refuses to be healed, a pain that is perpetual, that defies all anesthetic. This is a pain that continuously provokes its victims into acts of desperate rage, as tormented by the thorn within, they attempt to rid themselves of it. Throughout this century, wars have been fought in the Mideast to end the pain. They have only increased it. The nations have gathered round, attempting through many proposals to bring peace, to no avail. Instead, the pain only intensifies. Why is it that there has been no cure? It is because beneath the crisis in the Mideast is a crisis of perception and understanding. There has been no remedy because few understand or have the courage to understand why the Mideast bleeds. For the past century, the secular world has largely accepted a religious argument justifying Israel's occupation of Palestine. Yet that religious argument that God gave Palestine to the Jews is a half-truth. The whole truth is that God repeatedly warns in the Old Testament that if the Jews do not obey Him, practicing justice and righteousness, He will expel them from their promised land. They cannot come back until they obey. Hello, I'm Ted Pike, and this is my wife, Elin. Ignoring God's terms of no obedience, no return, both Zionists and evangelical Christians have rammed a cruel and unbiblical return to Palestine down the throats of the Arab world. The result? Perpetual strife rending the Mideast, international terrorism plaguing the whole world. This video chronicles at least 75 years of Zionist abuses and atrocities endorsed by evangelical Christians. Yet Jews and Christians can still do what is right. This video also presents the only workable plan, the biblical one, for peace in the Mideast. Let's turn now to what the Bible says on this controversial issue. God's conditional terms of occupancy are bluntly laid down in Leviticus 26, 27, and 33. Yet if in spite of this you do not obey me, but act with hostility against me, then I will act with wrathful hostility against you. You I will scatter among the nations and will draw out a sword after you, as your land becomes desolate and your cities become waste. Deuteronomy 4, 25 through 27 continues. When you do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord your God, so as to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you shall surely perish quickly from the land. You shall not live long on it, but shall be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the nations where the Lord shall drive you. And in Deuteronomy 28, 63 and 64, If you are not careful to observe all the words of this law, you shall be torn from the land where you are entering to possess it. Moreover, the Lord will scatter you among all peoples. Such is God's threat to expel the Jews. What are his terms for letting them back in? In Deuteronomy 30, 2 and 3, God says that when you return to the Lord your God and obey Him with all your heart and soul, then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. Clearly, obedience to God, practicing mercy, justice, and righteousness is God's barest requirement before ever allowing the Jews to enter Palestine. This timeless principle of no obedience, no occupation was illustrated in the time of Joshua. In Numbers 13, 25 through 33, God invited the Hebrews to occupy Palestine by faith. Yet when unbelief emerged, he refused to let them in. Ultimately, he condemned that generation to die in the wilderness. Only a new, obedient generation would be allowed to take root in a land dedicated to obedience. 
Earlier, the spiritual colossus Moses had passionately desired to enter Canaan, just as Zionists desire to occupy Palestine today. Yet God refused to let him in, because on one occasion he failed to sanctify God among the congregation. In the Old Testament, when Israel and Judah rejected God, both nations were exiled from Palestine, the northern kingdom of Israel by the Assyrians in 721 B.C., the southern kingdom by the Babylonians in 597 B.C. Only abject repentance entitled a small remnant under Ezra and Nehemiah to return from Babylon and again occupy their land of promise. After the Jews' rejection and crucifixion of Christ, they were again scattered among the nations in fulfillment of God's ancient decree. Today the Zionists still have not repented. As a nation, they have not practiced justice, mercy, and righteousness, giving God the obedience He demands. In fact, modern Zionism, supported by evangelical Christianity, claims that obedience no longer matters. Zionism says God endorses Jewish settlement in Palestine without obedience. According to Zionism, God continues to fight rebellious Israel's battles and causes the land under disobedient Jewish occupation to blossom as a rose. Without biblical truth in the Middle East, there can only be bitterness, chaos, and death. Whom should the world recognize as the rightful occupants of Palestine? Let's go back to 597 BC when Judah was exiled to Babylon because of her sins. God gave temporary rights of occupation to anyone who wanted to inhabit Palestine. God endorsed occupation by people known as Samaritans. For them, occupation was not conditional upon strict obedience. What was vitally important to God was that unrepentant Jews not be allowed as a nation to occupy His Holy Land. Today the Palestinians enjoy the same divine approval to occupy the land that God gave the ancient Samaritans. Do Palestinians own the land? No. According to scripture, Israel owns the land. St. Paul makes it clear in Romans 9 that ownership of Palestine belongs to fleshly Israel through God's covenant. Yet she cannot occupy what she owns as long as she remains in unbelief. Violation of God's law always produces grief and discord. That is why all peace proposals in the Middle East have failed. America's endorsement of Zionism will only entangle us in further animosity in the Middle East. What is the right thing to do? The right thing to do, according to the Bible, is for Jews in Palestine to return to the safe and prosperous Jewish communities scattered throughout the world. There, according to Jeremiah 29, 4-7, they are to build, plant, and seek the peace of those kingdoms in which they dwell. Advocacy of such a return does not encourage persecution of Jews. Instead, it is a blessing, helping deliver them from further anti-Semitism. The fact is, Zionism stimulates hatred of Jews. The modern state of Israel was established to provide safe haven for European Jewry. Yet, ironically, the Zionist occupation of Palestine, as they persecute and expel the Palestinians, only heightens hatred of the Jewish people. In fact, it would be difficult to imagine a less secure place for Jews than Israel today. The argument can be made, of course, that God's law is impractical in the 21st century. Yes, it is inconvenient, but it is also God's law and therefore the right thing to do. The alternative, heightened hatred and possible world war, destroying staggering numbers of Arabs, Jews, and probably Americans is much more inconvenient. This threat is even more ominous because of the prevalence of weapons of mass destruction in the world today.
tragically, despite the clearest scriptural ban against Jewish reoccupation of Palestine, both Israel and its evangelical supporters remain more determined than ever to make the Zionist experiment succeed at any cost. This results in even more determined and fanatical Arab resistance, as evidenced by the Trade Center attack of September 11, 2001. The Arab world today is angry and even violent, like a tiger with a thorn in its paw. If the thorn Israel would remove itself, the tiger, relieved of its pain, would relax. The Mideast would return to relative peace. Arab international terrorism would have lost its primary reason to exist. If the thorn Israel would remove itself, there would be no need for an American war on terrorism. Government snooping and loss of individual rights and privacy in the name of homeland security would be unnecessary. There would be no need for America to make the Middle East safe for Israel. All these sacrifices lead back to the false premise that Christian civilization has a religious duty to preserve the political state of Israel at any cost. Someday, the Bible tells us, a remnant of Jews will return to God out of great tribulation. They will give him the obedience he demands. At Christ's second coming, he will lead this believing remnant back to the land of their forefathers. They will dwell there lawfully in peace. This will be the only biblically legitimate return the Jews will make to Palestine since their rejection of Christ nearly 2,000 years ago. Such a return will gloriously fulfill hundreds of Old Testament prophecies. Yet for the present, both Zionists and Evangelicals continue to ram a counterfeit return down the throats of the Arab world. As a result, the Mideast continues to bleed. How did the world get into this dilemma? The crisis in the Middle East has its roots over 2,500 years ago. As we have seen, Nebuchadnezzar was used by God to uphold his law and exile Judah to Babylon. In Babylon, the Jews were suddenly without the capital city and temple on which they had always depended as the focus of their worship. As a result, a class of priests arose in Babylon called Sophrim or scribes. These assumed the role of providing religious education and leadership to the exiled Jews. By the time Christ came on the scene, this priestly class, by then called the scribes and Pharisees, had completely overturned the written law of Moses, substituting their own opinions, called the oral tradition. Through this, they made the law of God of none effect. Such opinions, largely formulated under Babylonian influences, are now contained in the vast, rambling Babylonian Talmud. Modern Orthodox Jews regard the Talmud of the Pharisees as of much higher authority than the Bible. Popular Jewish author Hermann Wuk affirms the importance of the Talmud to Judaism. The Talmud is to this day the circulating heart's blood of the Jewish religion. Whatever laws, customs, or ceremonies we observe, whether we are Orthodox or Conservative or Reform or merely spasmodic sentimentalists, we follow the Talmud. It is our common law. The world is baffled that in Israel today the Jews once persecuted have become persecutors. Highly educated religious Jews, especially in the government and army, are now treating the Palestinians much lower than they would treat any animal. In his film Gaza Strip, veteran filmmaker James Longley graphically documents how the Israeli military shoots Arab children through the head for the crime of throwing stones. From helicopters, the Israelis drop canisters of debilitating nerve gas on the inhabitants of Gaza. Like the Soviets in Afghanistan, they leave booby-trapped toys on the ground in order to blow up curious children. The explanation for such behavior is found in the Talmud. The Talmud teaches the superiority and divine right of Jews over Gentiles. 
the Jew is holy because of God's special racial covenant with Israel. According to the Talmud, the reason why the Gentiles are unclean is because unlike the Jews, they were not present at Mount Sinai. By standing on the mount, the Jews were perpetually cleansed from lustful thoughts. The Talmud says that when the serpent came to Eve, he infused filthy lust in her. But by contrast, when Israel stood on Sinai, that lust was eliminated. In its article on Gentiles, the authoritative Jewish Encyclopedia summarizes the Talmud's view of Jewish moral superiority. The Talmud comments on the untruthfulness of Gentiles and contrasts it with the reputation of the Jew. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. Judah ben Eli recommends the daily recital of the benediction, Blessed be thou who has not made me a goy, or Gentile. The Talmudic writers, this article continues, said that only Israelites are men. Gentiles they classed, not as men, but as barbarians. Thus the Pharisees proclaimed that all the congregation of Israel are holy. They are so holy, the Talmud says, that he who smites an Israelite on the cheek is as though he had assaulted the divine presence. The world is shocked at how Israel criminalizes Arab young people, often shooting them down as if they were animals. Yet this is exactly how the Talmud teaches Jews to regard Gentile children. The Talmud outlaws the issue or child of a Gentile as that of a beast. During the Intifada uprising in Gaza in 1988, the world was also horrified that Israeli soldiers buried alive in a pit four Palestinian youths. Yet that is very similar to what the Talmud teaches is permissible for a Jew. The Talmud says that if a Jew throws his neighbor into a pit which contains a ladder, then hastens to remove the ladder, he is not liable for the death of his neighbor. If a Jewish Christian falls into a pit and there was a step in the pit wall, the Jew has the right to scrape it away, condemning the Christian to death. The Jew is also permitted to roll a large stone over the pit opening, guaranteeing his victim does not survive. Or, should there have been a ladder in the pit, the Jew is encouraged to remove it, claiming he needs it to rescue his son from a roof. The Talmud's homicidal hatred of Gentiles leaps from its pages. One of the Talmud's most respected rabbis, the great Simeon ben Yohai, is quoted by the Jewish Encyclopedia. The best among the Gentiles deserves to be killed. The best of snakes ought to have its head crushed. Today in Israel, during the annual festival of Lag Baomer, tens of thousands of Orthodox Jews assemble in Meron, the traditional burial place of Simeon ben Yohai. Through song, dance, and exhortation, they honor his memory. The prestigious Encyclopedia Judaica describes ben Yohai as one of the giants of Judaism for all time. Israel's official policy toward the killing of innocent Arabs has been strikingly similar to Simeon ben Yohai's. In war, when our forces storm the enemy, they are allowed and even enjoined by the Halakha, or Talmudic law, to kill even good civilians, that is, civilians who are ostensibly good. According to the Talmud, those who deny the Torah and the prophets of Israel, the law is that all those should be killed. And those who have the power of life and death should have them killed. And if this cannot be done, they should be led to their death by deceptive methods. The Talmud clearly does more than dehumanize Palestinians. It dehumanizes Jews. The Talmud is the scalpel that makes the Mideast bleed. 
The mystical Zohar, or Kabbalah, like the Talmud, is considered by Orthodox Jews to be inspired by God and equal in authority to the Talmud. Many ultra-Orthodox Jews, such as predominate in Israel today, consider it of even greater authority than the Talmud. In the Zohar, the idea is everywhere repeated that Jews are holy beings, essential for the existence of the world. Gentiles, however, are demonic and less than human. The Zohar says, a living soul refers to Israel, who have holy living souls from above, and cattle and creeping thing and beasts of the earth to the other people who are not living souls. The Zohar continues, the ass means non-Jew, who is to be redeemed by the offering of the lamb, which is the dispersed sheep of Israel. But if he refuses to be redeemed, then break his skull. They should be taken out of the book of the living. Here, Israeli troops treat captured Egyptian soldiers like the beasts the Zohar describes them as. Ordering the Egyptians to run for their lives, they shoot them in the back for sport. According to the Zohar, God rewards Jews for slaughtering those whom Israel regards as idolaters. In the palaces of the fourth heaven are those who lamented over Zion and Jerusalem and all those who destroyed idolatrous nations. And those who killed off people who worship idols are clothed in purple garments so that they may be recognized and honored. Only by the overthrow of the Gentiles, the Zohar asserts, can Israel regain its predestined position as God's Shekinah glory on earth. The Zohar calls Gentiles Amalekites. In a passage typical of many, the Zohar says, it caused the destruction of the temple. So when God reveals himself, they will be wiped off the earth. Redemption will not be complete until Amalek will be exterminated. Today, the religious and military establishment of Israel commonly refer to the Palestinian Arabs as Amalekites. Until final conquest of the Gentiles, the Zohar asserts that Israel can use any means necessary to assure victory. Rabbi Jehuda said to him, Rabbi Chezkiah, He is to be praised who is able to free himself from the enemies of Israel. And the just are much to be praised to get free from them and fight against them. Rabbi Chezgia asked, How must we fight against them? Rabbi Jehuda said, By wise counsel thou shalt war against them. By what kind of war? The kind of war that every son of man must war against his enemies, which Jacob used against Esau, by deceit and trickery wherever possible. They must be fought against without ceasing until proper order be restored. Thus it is with satisfaction that I say we should free ourselves from them and rule over them. Thus, the Talmud teaches, Jewish obedience is no longer necessary, either to enter heaven or to abide in the land of Palestine. What is vital to Orthodox Jews and modern Zionists is to be part of an unconditional racial covenant with God. Yes, Judaism does encourage Jews to attend synagogue, pray, and perform acts of charity, especially toward Jewish causes. Yet such good works fall beneath the biblical requirement that Jews love the Lord with all their heart and their neighbor as themselves, if they are to enter heaven. Judaism even requires repentance of a sort. But what it means by repentance is very inadequate. Once every year on the eve of Yom Kippur, millions of Jews worldwide recite the Kol Nidra prayer. They repent of all the sins, great or small, which they may commit over the next year. Having repented, they are then free to commit those very sins, confident that should they die during that time, they will go to heaven. Tragically, the Kol Nidra prayer has been a primary cause of anti-Semitism throughout the centuries. This is because it gives Jews the right to break promises over the next year, not just to God, but to man. 
Historically, many Gentiles, especially in Europe, have correctly understood that the word of a Jew who prays the Kol Nidra prayer cannot be trusted. As Henry Ford said, it requires no argument to show that if this prayer be really the rule of faith and conduct for the Jews who utter it, ordinary social and business relations are impossible to maintain with them. So firm is Judaism's belief in God's approval via this covenant that the Talmud, Judaism's highest legal authority, repeatedly gives Jews the right to cheat Gentiles, deceive a Gentile, and take away his property and land, including Palestine. The Almighty offered the Torah to the Gentile nations also, but since they rejected it, he withdrew his shining legal protection from them and transferred their property rights to Israel, who observed his law. The wealth of the Achim, Gentiles, is to be regarded as common property and belongs to the first who can get it. The ethics of the Pharisees and of modern Judaism are thus very different from the ethics of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God made it abundantly clear that the Jews could find salvation or occupy the land only through faith in God and works of righteousness and mercy to others, including Gentiles. God told the prophet Ezekiel that only by continued trust and obedience in him could anyone be saved. God said in Ezekiel 33:12 that if even a righteous man rebelled and did not repent, he would lose his soul. Jesus and the New Testament writers continued this conditional emphasis, always stressing the necessity of lifetime obedience in order to go to heaven. Jesus said that anyone seeking eternal life must first yield his will to Christ and, trusting only in Christ's mercy, follow him till death. So radical and transforming was Christ's requirement that he called it being born again. The Pharisees, however, emphasized not righteousness toward others, but self-righteousness for Jews. They whipped up feelings of racial superiority among the Jewish people, a superiority unheard of in the Old Testament. Such attitudes antagonized the Gentiles surrounding Israel at the time of Christ. Gentiles, realizing they were despised by Jews, exacted revenge. Such revenge broke out with fury in 70 AD when Jerusalem was destroyed, and again in 135 AD when the rebellion of the false Messiah, Bar Kochba, and his Jewish followers was crushed by the Romans. Consequently, Jews were forbidden by the Romans to dwell in Palestine. Israel, having rejected her true Messiah, was again scattered to the nations in fulfillment of the law of God. Nineteen hundred years later, however, Jewish hope for return to Palestine revived. During the latter part of the 19th century, hatred of Jews was at a high level in Russia, Poland, and Eastern Europe. This was largely a result of popular awareness that Jews comprised the primary leadership of communist and socialist movements, especially in Russia. The Zionist Back to Israel movement gained momentum during World War I. Zionist leaders powerfully influenced America and Britain to help provide a Palestinian homeland for such hated Eastern European Jews. There was one problem. The Turks, ancient rivals of Western civilization, had ruled the majority of the Middle East for 400 years. They also opposed a Jewish homeland in Palestine. On the other hand, most Arabs under Turkish control yearned to overthrow Turkish oppression and find freedom. As a result, the Arabs favored the Western allies in World War I. The Arab world hoped that, should the allies be victorious over Germany and the Turks, Britain could oversee the Middle East, giving liberty to all Arabs, including Palestinians. For this reason, during World War I, the Arabs were trusted allies of the West, assisting British forces and their military leaders, such as Lawrence of Arabia, in fighting the Turks. When the Allies were victorious, the Arabs obtained freedom at last. Yet in Palestine it was different. 
the British, to the astonishment of the Arabs, announced through the Balfour Declaration that Palestine would be shared between its Arab inhabitants and European Jews. The Arabs felt betrayed. Britain had led them to expect an independent state for Palestinian Arabs. On the other hand, the British government made it clear that in allowing Jews to purchase, lease, and thus control large amounts of Arab land in Palestine, special favor would not be given to the Jews. Jews were to be viewed on equal footing legally with the Arab population. The Zionists had a different point of view. They believed God's covenant granted all of Palestine to Jews alone. They saw the Arabs even though they had lived in Palestine for 1,300 years as squatters. The task before the Zionists, even from their earliest beginnings, was the removal of the Arabs. The Zionist settlers, being largely subsidized by foreign Jewish capital from Europe and the U.S., were in a position of great advantage over the poor and backward Palestinians. Far from comprising a humble, repentant remnant such as God allowed to occupy Palestine under Joshua and Ezra, most Jewish settlers who inhabited Palestine in the 20s and 30s were Marxist Jews from Russia and Eastern Europe. Their goal was to establish an ideal communist state in Palestine. With this in mind, collectives called kibbutzes were formed, Built on Marxist ideals, these were established on land obtained from the Arabs. Only Jews were allowed to farm and benefit from them. For the most part, no Arab labor was permitted, nor were Arab goods purchased. The result of this abrasive policy of economic separation was that as early as the 1920s, Palestine had become polarized. The Zionists disregarding the territorial rights of the Arabs, did all they could to economically elbow the Palestinians out of the land of their ancestors. The Arabs, realizing the Zionists would settle for nothing less than total control of Palestine, became embittered. During 1936, Arab riots flared throughout Palestine. The British government also was displeased with Zionist dominance of the Arab population. The Balfour Declaration stipulated that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. The British knew the Zionists had made a mockery of this provision, trampling on its guarantee of Arab rights. Britain had envisioned a relatively small haven in Palestine for persecuted world Jewry, not a Zionist power dominating the region. As a result, before World War II, Britain restricted further immigration. All Zionists opposed such restrictions. But a Jewish terrorist organization, Ergen, went further. Headed by Menachem Begin, Ergen declared all-out war on the British through sabotage, assassinations, and bombings. Here are two British soldiers, murdered by Begin's terrorists and booby-trapped in order to kill more British. Finally, in 1947, the British, sick of the thankless task of overseeing Palestine, scheduled transfer of Palestine to control by the fledgling, inexperienced United Nations. The UN resolved that Palestine be partitioned into two states, one Zionist, one Arab. Jerusalem was to remain an international zone to be enjoyed by Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Partition was to take place on May 15, 1948. Of course, the UN had no right to give Arab property to anyone. Nevertheless, although Jews owned less than 6% of Palestine at that time, the UN voted to give most of Palestine to the Jews. Resolution 181 granted Jews 57% of the land. The Arabs, who had formerly occupied 94% of Palestine, now possessed only 43%. Yet even this colossal land grab did not satisfy the Zionists. They claimed all of Palestine. 
They resisted the idea of coexistence with a Palestinian state, just as they do today. As a result, 26 days before separate independence was to be declared for both Jews and Arabs, Zionist covert forces began a program of terrorism aimed at driving Arabs out of Palestine. The National Geographic tells us, at 4 o'clock on the morning of April 19, 1948, 132 Jewish terrorists from the Ergen and Stern gang fell upon the peacefully sleeping Arab village of Deir Yassin, west of Jerusalem. For eight terrible hours, murder occurred until more than 200 men, women and children lay dead, 15 houses dynamited. The corpses were piled in a nearby quarry and burned, and that pillar of black smoke has darkened the Jerusalem air ever since. Today, a hospital for the mentally ill covers the site. Many think that use appropriate. Ergen leaders like Menachem Begin, who was not present at Deir Yassin, have denied the accusation of atrocity. The deaths were a result of what he considered then and now a legitimate military action. Televangelist Dr. Jerry Falwell, a close friend and supporter of Prime Minister Begin, called Begin a great man of God. The Deir Yassin massacre is credited with frightening Palestinians out of their ancestral homelands as no other Jewish tactic until that time had been able to do. Begin made it clear that not only were Jewish forces capable of such unthinkable atrocities, but they would repeat them again and again as long as Palestinians resisted. After May 15, 1948 arrived, roving Zionist trucks mounted with loudspeakers blared to the Arabs that if they did not flee immediately, they would be slaughtered. With Deir Yassin vividly in mind, and fearing a bloodbath all the way to the Jordan River, roughly 800,000 Arabs fled in panic. At the same time, now that their British protectors were gone, they appealed to their Arab brethren for help. Yet the Arab forces, poorly armed and ill-prepared, were no match for the aggressive Israeli army, supplied with the latest military hardware by the Soviets. When the war ended, Israel controlled 78% of Palestine. Thus the Arabs, after being promised by the British a national homeland in Palestine if they helped defeat the Turks, and being assured under the Balfour Declaration that Palestinian rights would be respected as equal with the Jews, and being scheduled by the United Nations to have their own independent state on May 15, 1948, the Palestinian Arabs ended up with none of these things. Instead, Having lost their farms and businesses to the Israelis, more than a million Palestinians were herded into internment camps where they and their children would learn to hate Israelis, Christians, and the treacherous West for the next 50 years. Following the so-called Jewish War of Independence against the Arabs in 1948, Israel seized, without compensation, between 90 and 100 percent of the Arab and Christian homes and property in cities of Palestine it now controlled. Most owners, which included a high percentage of Christian Palestinians, were forced to find refuge in slums or refugee camps, never allowed to return. Zionists have been able to seize Arab lands and property in Palestine and drive out their occupants because of the romantic, pseudo-biblical idea that Jews have a God-given right to live in the land, even if disobedient to God. This premise, coupled with intense sympathy for Jewish sufferings, blurs and desensitizes the Christian West to what it really means in human terms to be a Palestinian Arab. It is difficult for us to imagine what it is to lose house, land, and livelihood in order to make possible the Jewish Christian dream of a national homeland for the Jews. What if tanks and bulldozers appeared at the end of your street? What if the bulldozers actually leveled your house? 
What if you and your family were trucked far away to live for the next 50 years in a ramshackle tent city amid squalid subhuman conditions dependent upon charity from the United Nations? If you can imagine such an outrage, maybe then, for the first time, you can actually understand what it feels like to live inside the skin of a Palestinian. For this is exactly what has happened to the Palestinians again and again and again throughout this century. Zionism, peace proposals, partition, all meant one thing, loss of homes, land, and livelihood. If you as an American were huddled in the cold of a refugee camp and you knew very well that it was Christians who had given the government the moral authority to have your home bulldozed, would you not do everything in your power to oppose Christianity? Physical resistance for you might not seem out of the question. Rather, it might be the only way to hold back the aggression and get the attention of an indifferent world. As a result of their hasty flight from Palestine, roughly 400,000 Palestinian citizens lost their birth certificates. The newly formed State of Israel then upheld that only those who can prove citizenship are entitled to live in Israel. On this pretext alone, 400,000 Palestinians lost all their property to the Zionists and were forbidden to return. Soon after, in 1950, Israel passed its law of return, guaranteeing every Jew worldwide the right to dwell in Palestine. The Palestinians, having lived there for 1,300 years, continued to be denied that right. By 1967, Arab anger over the plight of the Palestinians had again reached the boiling point. The Arab allies of the Palestinians Egypt, Jordan, and Syria mobilized on Israel's borders. Yet they were suddenly attacked and defeated by the Israeli Air Force during the Six-Day War. Consequently, the Palestinians found themselves even worse off than before. East Jerusalem, occupied by the Arab Palestinians, was annexed. The Golan Heights were taken from Syria. The Sinai, including Gaza, from Egypt. The west bank of the Jordan River, from Jordan. In a September 1983 article, the Reader's Digest describes how in Israel an Arab population of 800,000 lives under harsh military rule. Fifty percent of their land was confiscated for supposed security reasons. In place of Arab farms, Jewish settlements sprang up. Yet Arabs were restricted in their right to buy land or rent housing. Arab cities in Israel, such as Nazareth, composed of Arab citizens, were largely deprived of funds, services, water, economic aid, and educational opportunities. Writing in 1983, the Reader's Digest commented, an order last year subjected the Arabs to torture, a system of constant harassment through frequent arbitrary arrests and curfew. Jewish settlers were officially encouraged to carry arms and use them if necessary. After 1967, Prime Minister Menachem Begin had announced plans to make the West Bank part of Israel. In preparation for this eventuality, the occupied West Bank was crisscrossed with extra-wide highways between Jewish settlements. Avoiding Arab cities, such thoroughfares cut through Arab orchards and farmlands. The hundreds of miles of such asphalt benefited the numerous illegal Jewish settlements, yet blighted the Palestinians. Describing such roads, the Reader's Digest continues. In defiance of international law and numerous UN resolutions, such settlements proliferated in the 1970s as Israel confiscated 65% of Arab land in Palestine. The Fourth Geneva Convention of International Law states that foreign countries may not colonize and build settlements in occupied territory. Yet Israel continues to build settlements throughout Arab lands it does not own. For almost 40 years it has enticed Israelis to settle in the West Bank, providing housing two-thirds cheaper than Jerusalem. In fact, it sells West Bank real estate to American Jews 
and by 2010, Israel plans to fill the West Bank with settlements and 1,400,000 Jews. The Reader's Digest concludes its article critical of Israel, saying, Antagonizing the Israeli Arabs was an obvious blunder. If treated with decency, they could have become a bridge to the Arab world. God commanded the Hebrews under Moses that once they occupied Palestine, they were not to oppress the strangers in that land. If modern Israel had obeyed no other commandment, the Mideast would not bleed today. Clearly, Israel hopes to evict the Palestinians with the power, not necessarily of guns and tanks, but of masons and bulldozers. Israel is also flooding the West Bank with hundreds of industrial plants and capital-intensive industries, economically out of reach of most Palestinians. 91% of imports to Arabs come from Israel, with trade from Arabs to Israel discouraged. Arab businesses are heavily taxed and harshly penalized for late payment. Very little outside capital, which might stimulate Arab enterprise, is allowed into the occupied territories. Arabs living in Israel are subject to travel restrictions and censorship. In many departments of the Israeli government, there is no provision for Arab representation. All cultural, traditions, and literature which might inspire Arab pride are discouraged. For Palestinian Arabs, it is difficult just to eke out a living as a farmer. This is because the Zionists suppress competition to Israeli agriculture. The West Bank of the Jordan is primarily an agricultural region, with Arabs depending on crops such as olives and high-quality citrus. Yet production and marketing of such perishable crops is severely hampered by Israeli checkpoints. All Palestinians, including farmers, are capriciously detained, sometimes for days as they attempt to go about their business. Ambulances containing medical emergencies, vehicles bringing relief supplies and fresh water, as well as the average worker attempting to commute to work in Israel, are subject to the whim of guards at checkpoints. To make matters worse, the occupying Israeli army has bulldozed earthen barricades across roads everywhere in the West Bank and Gaza, often shooting at Palestinians who attempt to remove them. In fact, being randomly shot at by Israeli troops is a daily hazard to all Palestinians. If a Palestinian, young or old, is killed, there is no punishment to the shooter, whether he be an Israeli soldier or settler. Israelis will simply say they thought the Arab was intent on a suicide bombing. Case closed. Olive trees have been the basis for the Palestinian economy for thousands of years. Yet more than 6,000 olive trees have been uprooted by the Israelis. The invading Israelis also routinely destroy productive farmland and plug wells shutting off water to a desperately thirsty land. Very few new Arab wells have been allowed in the past decades, with many being permitted in Jewish settlements. The National Geographic comments, since 1967, all water resources in the territory have been put under Israeli state control. Palestinians who need to drill a well or repair an old one need a permit. Such permits, which require approvals from a variety of Israeli committees and departments for a single well, are rarely granted. Today, Israelis consume five times as much water per head as Palestinians, many of whom must rely entirely on water trucked in from distant wells during the dry summer months. Israeli inhabitants of the settlements, where swimming pools are plentiful and crop irrigation common, use even more water. If a Palestinian youth cannot face life as a farmer under such oppressive restrictions, he will also be frustrated in attempts to gain a higher education. All universities in the occupied territories which are critical of Israeli occupation have been closed, as well as dozens of secondary schools. Students are subject to capricious arrest and physical punishment. 
Many students have been fatally shot while opposing Israeli policies. The Israelis describe such students not as patriots, but terrorists. Here, a young Palestinian is detained, stripped, forced to lie down, then shot through the head. Such atrocities are not exceptional, but typical of Zionist oppression of the Palestinians. Here, an Israeli soldier pulls a Palestinian girl upward by her hair. Here, a soldier shoves the head of an Arab woman against a wall. The very young are especially mistreated. During the Intifada, 600 Arab children, 13 to 17 years old, were arrested, primarily for throwing stones. The sentence for most was a year in prison. They were tortured, beaten, deprived of sleep, and threatened with death. Finally, the children went on a hunger strike, but were tear-gassed in their cells. Such mistreatment turns the youth of the West Bank and Gaza not into farmers and merchants, but into terrorists. Yet this is exactly what the Israeli government wants. Every time a suicide bomber blows himself and Israelis up, the Israeli military again has a pretext and world approval to further collectively punish the Palestinians. Israel thus produces and ultimately benefits from acts of terrorism. Despite the present tragedy of suicide bombings in Israel, such terrorism makes possible Israel's long-range strategy to bulldoze Arabs off the land to be replaced by Israeli settlements. After more than 80 years, the Zionist objective of economic strangulation of Palestinians is succeeding. Up to 20,000 Palestinians a year despair and migrate to Europe and America. Unbelievably, the same economic backwardness which the Israelis impose on the Palestinians is used as an argument against them. Both Israelis and Christian evangelicals say Israel's prosperity, in contrast to the Palestinians, is proof that God is on the side of the Israelis. The truth is, more than $3 billion in U.S. annual aid is the real reason behind the economic success story that is Israel. The policies of Israel toward the Palestinians have been abrasive, largely because those in control Israel's premiers have often had shadowy backgrounds, little better than gangsters. Chief among these was Menachem Begin, head of the Zionist secret organization, Hergen. To persuade the British to leave Palestine, Begin and his fellow terrorists blew up the King David Hotel in Jerusalem in 1946, killing 200 British soldiers as well as 13 of his fellow Israelis. He masterminded the previously mentioned Der Yassin Massacre. In a conversation with British diplomat Lord Howe, Begin was asked if he was the father of terrorism in the Middle East. No, he replied expansively, I'm the father of terrorism in the whole world. His successor, Yitzhak Shamir, was head of the even more radical Stern Gang, so anti-British that it offered its services to Hitler. Shamir was not above killing any fellow Jew who got in his way. When impeded in his rise to leadership of the Stern Gang, Shamir took a walk with his opponent in the sand hills south of Jerusalem. Only Shamir returned, boasting that he alone would be the terrorist ruler of the Stern Gang. Shamir also masterminded the assassinations of Lord Moyne, British minister to the Middle East in 1944, and Count Bernadotte, United Nations Middle East diplomat in 1948. During the Gaza rebellion in 1988, Shamir's successor, Yitzhak Rabin, showed himself capable of similar brutality. The youth of Gaza, occupants of squalid refugee camps, finally erupted in stone throwing and street violence. Rabin gave explicit orders to all troops in Gaza to beat and break the bones of such youth without mercy. Hundreds of young Palestinians were maimed for life. The world was shocked when it learned that Israeli troops had thrown four Palestinian youths into a pit and buried them alive. 
One of the most ruthless and opportunistic prime ministers is Ariel Sharon. As defense minister, he orchestrated Israel's 1982 invasion of Lebanon. He provided aerial lighting to facilitate the killing of 800 innocent men, women, and children in the infamous Shatila and Sabra massacres. An Israeli fact-finding commission condemned Sharon's role in this atrocity, yet Menachem Begin defended him. Goyim are killing Goyim, Begum said, and we have to be responsible? Begin's chief of staff, Rafi Ali Tan, referred to the Lebanese Arabs as cockroaches in a bottle. During the Lebanon invasion under Sharon, 17,500 innocent civilians were precision bombed into rubble. Western observers such as World Vision's Stan Mooneyham visiting the scenes of destruction were appalled. Israeli forces refused to allow medical supplies, food and fresh water to the victims for weeks after the airstrikes. Such cruelty and indifference to Arab suffering has continued to distinguish Sharon, as evidenced by the 2002 invasion of the West Bank. Claiming the necessity to root out terrorists responsible for suicide bombings in Israel, Sharon leveled 4,000 Palestinian homes, destroying most of the economic infrastructure of the West Bank. This included most of the businesses, schools, as well as city governments in such cities as Jenin, Ramallah, and Hebron. Transportation and freedom of movement were brought to a standstill as many hundreds of cars were flattened by Israeli tanks and earthen roadblocks made travel impossible. Sources of electricity were destroyed. Supplies of water were especially targeted for destruction, eventually forcing Palestinian children to drink sewage or urine mixed with powdered milk. Perversely, while television transmission was continued, Israeli soldiers flooded the airwaves with hardcore pornographic films, horrifying the Muslim population. Such outrages were part of Sharon's program of collective punishment punishing four million Palestinians for the acts of terrorism by a few. During Sharon's 2002 invasion, collective punishment meant that U.S.-made Apache helicopters launched Hellfire missiles and machine-gunned refugee camps from the air. At the same time, U.S.-made tanks shelled the camps from the ground. It meant that Israeli troops were free to randomly fire upon and kill Palestinians, young and old, without fear of punishment. It meant blocking of ambulances and relief supplies, often leaving victims to slowly bleed to death. Collective punishment meant rounding up thousands of Palestinian men with summary execution of hundreds. Here such men are detained. Random victims will then be selected and shot. Here the body of such a random victim is removed. This photo shows five Palestinian policemen executed by the Israelis. Collective punishment meant that such captive Palestinians were often marched ahead of advancing Israeli tanks and bulldozers as human shields. Then Israeli tanks would shoot repeatedly through houses filled with Arab families. Then the bulldozers would follow, flattening the houses over the occupants, both dead and living. For many hundreds of Palestinians, the final act of Sharon's collective punishment and humiliation was to be scooped up along with the debris of their homes into trucks and deposited in landfills. Ethnically cleansed of their former inhabitants, many West Bank towns were bulldozed smooth. As a result, no one might ever have known that Palestinians had ever lived and loved and died in the moonscape that now exists between Bethlehem and Janine. In 1982, Ariel Sharon made a big mistake. He left 800 corpses rotting in the refugee camps of Shatil and Sabra for the news media of the world to see. In 2002, he first banned the media from the West Bank and then, avoiding huge acts of mass murder, he turned loose his troops to commit innumerable isolated acts of outrage. As a result, thousands of Palestinians were killed or injured, but in a way that is harder to quantify and easier to deny. 
On Bill Moyer's PBS series, Now, a visit to the interior of the shambles of a Palestinian government building gave proof to what the Hebrew newspaper Haaretz has alleged. Part of Sharon's policy of Arab humiliation has been that his troops urinate and defecate everywhere throughout Palestinian public buildings. Office equipment and furniture were routinely found covered with the urine and excrement of Israeli troops. Clearly, just as Israel was once held in bondage by Pharaoh, so today Israel, as a cruel taskmaster, rules the Palestinians with force and violence. Politically, the West pays a huge price for its support of Israel. Because of Israel, the Arab world, once an ally, has largely become an enemy of the West. Christianity has also been the loser. In siding with Israeli oppression, it has alienated the Muslim world from the Gospel. Many of Islam's 1.3 billion souls now equate Christianity with Zionist oppression. Since Israel could never have become what it is without the support of evangelical Christianity, the injustice of Zionism is not the only reason the Mideast bleeds. The Church must also share the blame. The Bible says that he who consents with a thief is a partaker with him. Let's turn now to the reasons behind the bizarre ethical confusion concerning Israel which exists in the church today. Although abuses by Zionism are the primary stimulus of international Arab terrorism, to understand why the Mideast bleeds, we also need to understand why evangelical Christians have supported such abuses. Thus, we need an understanding of Calvinism. Calvinism is the dominant interpretation of Christianity among evangelicals today. But before we discuss Calvinism, we should understand that it and Zionism are natural bedfellows for a simple reason. Calvinism, like Zionism, is covenant-oriented. It is not obedience-oriented, as is the Bible. Because Calvinism is not obedience-oriented, it tends to tolerate sin within its ranks. This helps explain why it overlooks the injustices of Israel. Such relatively low spirituality also helps explain the appalling callousness of evangelicals toward Israel's persecution of the Palestinians. Let's take a closer look at the history and teachings of Calvinism. Early in the 16th century, reformers such as Martin Luther and John Calvin led the Protestant Reformation. Calvin discovered a brand new system of spiritual security, guaranteeing heaven for the believer. Today, his doctrine of eternal security is the most widely accepted system of spiritual assurance among evangelical Christians. This idea claims that if we genuinely accept Christ as Savior, we can never be lost. No matter what sins we commit, we remain locked in an irrevocable covenant with God. Eternal security teaches that we will continue to sin because of our evil-producing flesh. But the blood of Christ, like a crimson blanket over a garbage dump, hides our sin from the view of God. The Father cannot or will not see such willful sin as adultery, fornication, and grudge-holding beneath the crimson veil of Christ's blood. Thus, Calvinism places its highest priority not on obedience, but on establishing a covenant with God, a covenant called the New Birth Experience. In fact, contemporary Calvinism says that once a believer has had the New Birth Experience, he is sealed into the covenant of salvation. If he continues to sin, he need not repent in order to go to heaven. I once heard the popular Calvinist preacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, say that if a genuinely born-again believer died unrepentant in the very act of adultery or homosexuality, he would go straight to heaven. On the other hand, if a supposedly born-again believer's sins become too embarrassing, Calvinism has a simple remedy. It separates itself from such a bad person saying, 
he was never really born again in the first place. However, if a believer's slanders and immoralities are occasional and not too scandalous, Calvinism keeps him in the church. He is compared to an eagle who dips his wings in the mud. Calvinism, because it contains no real threat of hell for born-again hypocrites, cannot hold back immorality. In fact, it inadvertently encourages it. Because Calvinism doesn't threaten its sinning saints with hell, millions today abuse the doctrine, taking advantage of its assurance that they can sin in this life and enjoy heaven in the next. This helps explain why divorce rates within evangelical churches often rival or even exceed the world's. In Calvinist community churches, 31% of adults are divorced. Compare that to 21% of atheists and agnostics. Yes, many sincere Calvinists do trust Christ daily and do not take advantage of the permission to sin which their doctrine offers. Such Calvinists, living godly lives despite the errors of their minds, will go to heaven. In their hearts, they have given God the obedient trust He wants. Yet, every year, Calvinist doctrine grows more permissive. The young especially abuse the doctrine of eternal security. It is little wonder that 86% of evangelical youth abandon the church after high school graduation. In Judaism, a covenant made over 4,000 years ago with Abraham makes Jews sacred in God's eyes, no matter what they do. This covenant allows Jews to occupy Palestine without obedience. In Calvinism, a covenant with the believer makes him righteous in God's eyes, no matter what he does. This covenant allows him to enter heaven. In fact, out of Calvinism came Schofield Dispensationalism. Schofield taught that God's moral requirements change during different periods or dispensations in mankind's history. Schofield said that while God required obedience for salvation during the Old Testament, now God only requires that believers be covered by Christ's blood. During the last century, Schofield's Calvinist doctrine has powerfully persuaded evangelicals to believe that Israel today is also in a new dispensation. Today's dispensation does not require obedience in order to occupy Palestine. Over the past 2,000 years, Calvinist Christianity and Judaism, despite outward differences, have evolved into a place of deep ethical agreement, a place which is foreign to biblical ethics. Since Judaism and Calvinism are so similar, it isn't surprising that they should cooperate hand in glove on the geopolitical level in the Middle East. What effect has such cooperation had on the Church? It has numbed the Church's conscience. Caught up in the romance and euphoria of what is claimed to be a biblical return of the Jews, the Church has grown indifferent to Israel's brutalization of the Palestinians. There seems literally no violence or human rights violation committed by Israel capable of shocking the Church. As stated earlier, by only blessing Israel, Calvinist America has joined with Israel as the primary cause of international, anti-American, anti-Christian terrorism, terrorism which culminated on September 11th. As they hold the coat of Israel while it bludgeons the Palestinians, evangelicals' own consciences are brutalized. Unshockable, they have lost all sensitivity to the human suffering of the Palestinian people at the hands of Israel. If the Church had stayed in touch with biblical reality, it would emphasize that, far from delighting God, Jerusalem is described in Scripture as Sodom and Egypt, a term symbolizing perversion and bondage. In Jerusalem today, effective Christianity is outlawed. Israel's anti-missionary law 
passed on December 25, 1977, gives up to five years in prison for any American Christian caught passing out so much as a gospel tract to an Israeli. Several years ago, 50 American evangelical organizations promised the government of Israel never to allow Christian witnessing in Israel. How different was their response than that of the apostles Peter and John in the book of Acts? When commanded by the Pharisees not to speak, the disciples witnessed more boldly than ever. Risking flogging and imprisonment, they said, We cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. If the church were true to the Bible, it would heed Scripture's many warnings to be suspicious of Judaism. Today, the ancient Pharisees, those who masterminded the crucifixion of Christ, are, through their Talmud, the greatest authorities for religious Jews. Jesus warned, Beware of the leaven or teaching of the Pharisees. He called down woe upon the Pharisees as children of hell, fools and blind, whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. He said they were a generation of vipers. Their father was the devil, and they and their Jewish congregation comprised the synagogue of Satan. Paul echoes Christ, saying, Beware of the concision or circumcision, meaning the Jews. He warns that although Christ will convert a beloved remnant of Jews at his second coming, for the present, unbelieving Jews remain enemies of the gospel. Describing the Jewish followers of the Pharisees, he said, The Jews killed the Lord Jesus and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men. The church has ignored these warnings to beware of the influence of Judaism. While very suspicious of groups such as Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, the church has rushed forward to associate itself with Judaism's culture, teachings, and political ambitions. As we look back over the creation of the State of Israel during this century, it is clear that for the most part, Israel was not brought into being by those who practiced justice and righteousness. Scripture says that if a man is righteous, God makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. The record of Zionism, on the contrary, is one of making peaceful neighbors into enemies, indeed, even into terrorists. Thus, although many Israelis may keep the Talmudic laws of the Pharisees, such piety falls far short of the compassion, mercy, justice, and love of one's neighbor as oneself which God requires in order for Jews to occupy the land. As we also look back over this century, we see the convergence of Judaic and Calvinistic ethics. Without exaggeration, Calvinist Christianity could have been tailor-made to assist the rise of Zionism. The government of Israel today wants Christian America to make war in the Middle East, removing all opposition to Israel. Eventual U.S. victory in such a war would help fulfill Ezekiel 38 and 39, making Israel impregnable in the region. Such prophesied peace and safety will only hasten Israel's rebuilding of the temple and acceptance of her false messiah, Antichrist. Scripture tells us that the time of Antichrist will be one of unprecedented persecution of both Christians and Jews. The church can avoid such a war. It can also avoid guilt for hastening the appearance of Antichrist. What is the easy way? By obeying the Bible and refusing to bid Godspeed to the evils of Zionism. Or, sadly, it can learn the hard way by receiving home the body bags of perhaps thousands of its children slaughtered in a senseless Mideast bloodbath in support of Israel. Clearly, Christian America, if it is to escape further entanglement with Zionism in the Middle East, must return to authentic Christianity. Only then can we reestablish an ethical and political foundation that truly serves Christian and American interests. 
Out of such a return to God's law, policies which have created discord and terrorism can be reversed. Although evil is prophesied to engulf the Mideast and the world, Scripture repeatedly assures us that for the present, obedience to God's law brings peace. The issue then is not necessarily to end evil, but to hold back evil. This we can do by God's grace, at least in our time. To help hold back evil in our time, the National Prayer Network offers vital tools to wake up your church and community. The first is Ted's 345-page book on the history of the Jews, past, present, and future, Israel, Our Duty, Our Dilemma, distilling 15 years of research in little-known Jewish sources. Ted comes to much more biblical and common-sense conclusions concerning Israel than are usually held in the Church today. Also, Ted's gripping one-hour video, The Other Israel, is the television version of the book. Fast-moving yet thoroughly documented, The Other Israel discusses the extent of Jewish influence in our time and what should be the Christian's response to it. In addition is Ted's 80-minute video, Hate Laws Making Criminals of Christians. This unprecedented expose reveals how the Jewish Anti-Defamation League is working tirelessly to establish so-called anti-hate laws in America, just as it has done in Canada. Such laws are not really anti-hate, but anti-Christian, outlawing criticism of such groups as Jews and homosexuals. Also, it is very important that you show the video you have just watched on your local public access TV station. How? Just lend them a copy of Why the Mideast Bleeds or any of our videos, and at no cost to you, they are obligated to repeatedly show it to tens of thousands. Ted's book, Israel, Our Duty, Our Dilemma, is 1595 postpaid. Our three videos are each 2490 postpaid. For foreign orders, add $10 U.S. funds per item. Order from National Prayer Network, P.O. Box 828, Clackamas, Oregon, 97015. Also, please visit our website at www.truthtellers.org. Yeah.